Give me some eyebrows. Yeah. Oh, come on, Charlie Brown. Oh, hello, Ari. Hey there. How are How you? How are you? I'm great. I like that mix. I do too. It puts you in a great mood. We talked about this last week when we were catching up on, on life and careers. You're like, do I have to go and do this head bop thing that I see people do on LinkedIn? And I said, no, you don't have to. And you smiled and you did it. And that just made me feel great. So that warmed the cockles of my heart. Thank you, my friend. I'm glad I can warm the cockles. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. For our viewers, for our audience, why don't you tell the viewership of the Oh Hello Vodden Pod, who I have the pleasure of speaking with right now? Sure. I'm Ari Papero. I like to call myself the ad tech influencer. I have a very long career in doing virtually everything you can do in ad tech, primarily on the product side as product management at Google and DoubleClick and Nielsen and AppNexus and Bizarre Voice. And then at my own company, Beeswax, where I was the CEO and I sold it to Comcast. And now I run Marketecture Media, which is a, a amazingly useful service at Marketecture.tv and a podcast about ad tech. Love it. That I... Uh... There we go. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ari. Thanks for coming out today. <laughs> that was, you encapsulated uh, a huge component of your career uh, as the founder of Marketecture, which uh, I'm a big fan of. I listen to the vast majority of the pods. I may have missed one or two here or there. I appreciate the content that you're putting out. Uh, additionally, we, Oh Hello Incorporated, we are ex excited about partnering up with Marketecture and just being uh, underneath your umbrella or part of your umbrella for the the pods and vods but that's not why we're here today we're here basically to take a layer off the onion layer by layer by layer and understand who ari paparo is you know peeling down the onion sounds like i'm going to be crying at the end so uh, i'll have to keep it on the light side well lots of warm fuzzies <laughs> with oh hello uh, from a career perspective as I said earlier, I've been on the product side. So product management as a discipline is fairly new. When I first got my first product management job in ad tech, it was a double click in 2004. So I'm coming up on my 20th year in ad tech. And the title and the job was still a work in progress. It wasn't always clear to the people you work with what that meant. And it wasn't clear to me And when I woke up in the morning what I was supposed to do. Uh, and there are these sort of trite sayings like product manager is the CEO of the product. Yeah, that's sort of true, but you also don't have to deal with rent or late billings or, or other things like that. So you're not really CEO of the product. CEO is CEO of the product. So, but the interesting thing about the product management career path is that it's both technical and creative and people oriented and project oriented and everything else and strategic. And so that's what I've enjoyed doing. I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades as CEO of Beeswax. I definitely had to do all that stuff, plus the boring stuff no one else wanted to do, clean the bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and now I find myself post exit doing something new. I'm kind of a journalist now. Uh, and I'm trying to get information into forums that are useful for people. How do you make the pivot from being a product leader to creating and starting your own company? Well, being a product leader is probably the best training for starting your own company because you're dealing with all of those complex issues around building a product and making people want it and actually selling it to people and then marketing it and then hiring a team. So it's a step more complicated and there's no safety net when you're the CEO, but it's a lot of the same activity. This sort of rhymes with the product job. I feel like I was always meant to start my own company. I think I did it kind of late. I guess I was in my 40s when I started Beeswax. And I had done a startup in the dot-com boom, but it wasn't really, you know, my baby alone. It was sort of a joint venture, joint activity with a bunch of other guys. So this was my first real go at it, and it went very well. So as someone who started a company in their 40s who had been successful prior to that, what advice could you give to someone like me who is 43 years old, who's worked at some great companies, who's had some fun and amazing roles, but wants to do it himself or with, you know, building with people. What kind yeah. of guidance or advice would you give me? First, I'll say, what do the stats say? So the stats say that older entrepreneurs are more successful. Uh, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world at 21 starting Facebook are not the common 
not the not the average. They're very uncommon. The the success rate goes up with age. The second thing I would say is that the statistics show that doing your own company is a 10 year commitment. And you have to know that. Are you going to be interested in working on this idea for 10 years? Because that's the average, even in a great scenario. Uh, I was lucky enough to exit Beeswax in less than six from start to finish, which is very unusual, very fast. But if you're 44 and you're starting a startup and you think it's going to be the next phase of your life, you should at a minimum think you're working on it when you're 54. And you have to also accept that it may be difficult during those 10 years, including periods in which you're paying yourself far less than your market rate or nothing. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no way around that. And I think that one thing I noticed when we were working at Beeswax, I had two co-founders who were amazing. And we always accepted we were going to have lower than average salaries. Uh, but we did pay ourselves for the first sort of six or seven months of the company. And we we're running through our seed funding pretty quickly, uh, just based on having to make payroll for the three of us each each period. And we made the choice to remove our salaries for a year and to take zero. And that really helped. And those are the kind of pretty hard decisions you have to make when you may have a mortgage and kids and all that sort of stuff. Having been a, a sales leader, a commercial leader, a marketer, you had said that when you're a product lead, it's really easy. So what about from your perspective of when you went and decided, okay, I'm a product lead, but now I need to also develop the sales pitch. I need to develop the marketing strategy. I need to develop everything that goes along with the commercial engine of, at the time, Beeswax, now from architecture. It was like the Big Bang. You know, all the particles were in one spot. Totally. And then over time, I replaced myself at various things. And some things I was very smart to replace myself quickly on because I wasn't that good at them. I hired a CTO right away. I wasn't going to be the CTO. And then other things, especially when it got to like year two and three, you know, all the particles were in one spot. Totally. And then over time, I replaced myself at various things. And some things I was very smart to replace myself quickly on because I wasn't that good at them. I hired a CTO right away. I wasn't going to be the CTO. And then other things, especially when it got to like year two and three, I didn't replace myself fast enough because I thought I was good at them. And also I sort of enjoyed doing them. And that's where there were some pretty big errors in judgment uh, around one thing that comes to mind is like finance. Uh, you know, we use outsource accounting for far too long. We needed a head of finance. We were running lots of money through beeswax and we didn't, we didn't get on top of it. Um, legal is another one. You know, we had a lot of paperwork going back and forth with various SAS contracts and we were, we didn't have a full-time lawyer uh, until, until it was well past the point where it was necessary. And each time I replaced myself, I was amazed at how much better I got at the rest of my job being uh, the job of a CEO, which is hiring strategy, leadership, direction, things like that, uh, because I wasn't spending two hours frustratingly on a phone call with some lawyer um, trying to figure out how to redline some complex contract. Delegation is really important. And so as you grew into the role and as you uh, delegated different hats to different people over time, when you think through mentorship and you think through just how you would teach them your different ways or your styles, or you would say, Hey, you've come to the table. You, you've, you have your experience, you have your seasoning, add it to the dish, add it to the entree. When you think about mentorship, what does mentorship mean to you? Well, I think it's not telling people what to do, uh, right? Uh, I, I'm an advisor to many startups and I see CEOs making some mistakes and every once in a while I'll actually tell them what to do. Uh, but most of the time I'll, I'll use analogies or histories or ideas to get them to do the things that they probably should be doing or thinking about, right? And so I think it, it's a two-way street and that the mentee needs to have enough self-awareness to know when their internal sort of biases and ego and other things might be pushing them in a direction of decisions that aren't optimal. Who are some mentors that you, that, that you want to call out, that you want to shout out, that have made a profound impact on who you have become and who you, I'll keep it at that. Who's made a big impact on you, Ari Paparo? Who are your professional mentors? Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Uh, I've been, well, I'm asking. <laughs> I've been around the blog. So, so one, probably the best boss I ever had was David Rosenblatt, who was the CEO of double click at, during the interim period before it was acquired by Google. Uh, and he was just 
a master he he gave a master class in i'd say business management from working with sales to holding people accountable to really focusing on the small things my favorite thing he would do is like a trick almost is like you whenever pre anyone presented like a really complicated deck or series of decisions to him he would sort of like not read them even though he probably read them and he, <laughs> he would just ask the person what's the one thing we could do to make change here <laughs> or what's the three what are the t top three things i need to do yep. and uh and that always caught people off guard because they had uh w didn't think in terms of like what if i can only do one or two things or what if i can only do three things i love that i've probably used that trick a number of times um so he love really that. comes to mind I worked for Neil Mohan for a while, who's now the CEO of YouTube, uh, and I think he was he was a great boss. And um, you know, I saw during my time at Google how incredibly ineffectual I was at playing corporate politics, and how amazing he was. And I mean that as a compliment. If Neil's listening, I do not mean to say anything bad about it, but the ability to get things done across teams that were in some cases hostile was amazing. And that's why he's the CEO of YouTube. And I left after two years. Well, it, you know where your strengths are and you know where your weaknesses are. And that's important in any ecosystem to be able to identify and move quickly. So you moved quickly. Yeah. And I think also there's this whole theory about, um, about focusing on your strength and don't try to fix your weaknesses. I forget some author, uh, I forget what it's called. There's a book about it. I kind of buy that a little bit, uh, but I don't think you can uh, ignore your weaknesses. You just have to surround yourself with people or processes that fix your weaknesses. That makes sense. I'm, I'm with you on that. As we create Ohello, ohello.io, uh, a platform specifically for mentorship mentees, expert advice, expert guidance, uh, being able to identify and pick and choose different people to uh, help one another we are able to plug into 50 different charities. What is a cause that is near and dear to your heart, Mr. Papara? Or causes plural? <laughs> My wife is very involved with a organization called uh, the New York International Children's Film Festival, which I'm a big fan of as well. It is a film festival of non-US films, but for children. And they are, in many cases, quite thought-provoking or serious they're not marvel and nonprofit, and um and i really like the cause it combines sort of art education a bunch of other things amazing ari before we conclude this oh hello podcast any other parting words of wisdom any 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 succinct advice for those watching for those listening i i find that a lot of folks are scared to sort of be themselves to be open to conversations that are not strictly within their lane, their swim lane in their career or life. And I think that's a mistake. If you go to my LinkedIn page, you'll see that I have my phone number on my LinkedIn page and it says, text me. Yeah. And, um, I've people texted, you. texted me, uh, yeah. a lot of people do not text me. A lot of people are scared to text me. And, uh, and it's funny because like, why wouldn't I want to hear from you? If, if I know you well enough to, that you found my LinkedIn page, is it really going to be any sweat off my back to say hi or to, or to direct message me on Twitter? And it's just me because I'm like sort of this little mini celebrity in the ad tech world. But like reach out to people, be friendly. Everyone wants to learn. It's a it's a collaborative world. It's not we're not in the NSA. We're not hiding secrets from each other. And I, I think just being a lot more open is good for your career, good for your success. And I'd recommend it. Amazing. Ari, thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on the Oh Hello Pod and Bob. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We appreciate you. Thank you for watching. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me.